Good morning and welcome everyone to another episode of StreakWave webinars. We're very pleased to have you today. My name is Richard Bernhardt. I'll be your host for today. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing for StreakWave Wireless. StreakWave Wireless is a global value-added distributor for the fixed wireless broadband industry. We host and hold webinars on topics relevant to the wireless industry and all the related topics. Um, I'm very proud today to be able to present to you MicroSemi. MicroSemi is an, a corporation that's been around for quite a long time, providing for power needs uh, for the entire network. Uh, today's host from MicroSemi is Mr. Daniel Feldman. He is the Vice President of Business Development and Channel Marketing for MicroSemi, and he is one knowledgeable person. So if you have questions in regards to POE, or using uh, mid-spans or any sort of powering questions associated with your network, he's the one to ask. He's the former chairperson of the Ethernet Alliance POE Technical Committee and was a member of the IEEE 802.3 AT Task Force. Uh, this is the people who set the standards for power, so it's a good guy to know. Mr. Feldman holds an MBA from UC Berkeley and the Haas School, uh, UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business and a BSc cum laude in computer engineering um, from Tech Union in Haifa, Israel. Um, I'd like to introduce Daniel, who's going to go through MicroSemi's um, uh, products and give you an overview of POE powering. If you have questions during this webinar, I invite you to type them into the digital section on questions. It's on your uh, control panel. We'll take questions throughout the webinar, and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, we'll amass those questions and hopefully get to all the questions that you have. If uh, any of the products that you see on this webinar um, are of interest to you or you have questions, you can call StreakWave at any time. Our toll-free number is 888-604-5234, or please feel free to come to streakwave.com at any time. Again, my name is Richard Bernhardt, and I'm very happy to uh, host this webinar. Welcome, Daniel Feldman, and let's begin. Thank you very much for the introduction, Richard. It's a pleasure uh, being here talking to this audience. So we'll talk about MicroSemi POE Midspans and Power Solutions, a compelling plan for powering your network. A little bit about MicroSemi uh, and formerly Power Design and Power of Ethernet. Power Design was established in 1995. It patented POE technology, holding the majority of patents on POE. It uh, has done deals with Network One and Cisco across licensing patents. We are the only company that supplies PoE IT semiconductors, the ones that are used to build PoE systems, PoE midspans themselves, PoE switches, and PoE test equipment. We have roughly 80% market share of the PoE midspan market, and I hope that by the end of the presentation you understand why. And we have roughly one third of the PoE uh, PSC IC market, the ICs that are used in switches, with over 200 million PoE ports shipped to date. We're designed into more than 400 uh, POE switches, and we have contributed to 802.3AF, 802.3AT, and the new, we are contributing right now to the new 802.3BT standard. You're a member of the Ethernet Alliance, uh, and we had the power over HD based standard at the HD based Alliance. That's a standard related to POE as well. On top of that, we are a Cisco solution partner, and uh, our design was acquired by MicroSemi in 2007. In terms of PoE quality, uh, the history of PoE and the history of MicroSemi and PoE are one and the same. We have been shipping for over 16 years uh, PoE, over 200 million PoE ports. Uh, we are the only company in the world that, with our experience, can give 16 years of warranty for our managed products, which means two refresh cycles. We do have the broadest portfolio of PoE midspans. Our PoE ICs are used by all major switch manufacturers. You name a switch manufacturer in the top 10, they use our PoE ICs. So we are experts in designing these systems from inside out. And our tech support has the direct access to the people who designed the chips and wrote the PoE and PoE standard. So when you ask a question, you're going to get to the top world experts uh, to get an answer. So what is this thing, power over Ethernet, power over HD-based C? These are technologies 
that allows handing power over Category 5 cabling or better to power either Ethernet or HD-based devices. Uh, there are four standards, 802.3AF, 802.3AT. They're both existing, ratified. There is the new 802.3BT standard being worked on by IEEE. And there is the power over HD-based or PO8 standard. They all support 100 meters of range. Uh, the standards are compatible with 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 uh, base T, and with HD base T5 as well. So you can mix and match any PoE standard with any uh, Ethernet or HD base T speed. And you can, with POH, you can send up to 95 watts on a single Category 5 cable. Now, when, when you think about 95 watts, People may think, well, but is that safe? It is safe. It is safe because it complies with UL 6950-1. All the voltages operating are below 60 volts, so you don't need a certified electrician for deployment. And better than that, the voltages are below 30 volts for any device that is not a POE device. There is detection and classification, two important stages they're used to identify whether is there really a PoE device connected to that cable before you increase the voltage above 30 volts. This is critical for deployment of equipment at wet locations. Now, people use PoE for different reasons. Cost savings, you don't need an AC outlet. You improve the network reliability. You can see in the picture on the bottom left, there is a UPS powering multiple mitzvahs. All these mitzvahs are powering the devices. You don't need one UPS per device. You need one UPS per 24, 48, 96 uh, devices being powered. We improve safety, as mentioned before, because we are below 60 volts and below 30 volts for detection and classification. It's easy to deploy. You don't need a certified electrician. You don't need to uh, do anything special to bring an Ethernet cable. You have 100 meters of range. And being a standard, you have interoperability. If we go into the details of the power levels of each standard, you can see here the date at which each standard was ratified. So 802.3F was from 2003. You could send 15 watts, receive 13. 802.3T, send 30, receive 25.5. That's from 2009. And that standard opens the door for sending 60 watts when you use all the four pairs in a CAT5 cable. So you can really uh, receive up to 51 watts at the end of 100 meters cable. Uh, Cisco calls this UPOE. We call this four pairs. It's very similar technology. And our technology is interoperable with Cisco's. We are a certified partner. Power over C base T uh, brings power to 95 watts at the source. And then at the end of 100 meters, one could receive up to 71.25 watts, which is enough to power a 41-inch TV these days. The new standard, as mentioned before, is the 802.3BT, which is the IEEE official standards for four pairs. Uh, it's right now in definition. So we, we used a, a few uh, terms that I didn't quite Defined. So let's talk about this PSE I mentioned uh, quickly. PSE is the power sourcing equipment. It's the equipment that sends power. There are two types of PSEs. There is the PoE switch, where you have chips, normally from microsemi, built into the switch. It's uh, common. It's a convenient PoE source. It's integrated. It takes less space. Uh, then there is the midspan, in which the PoE system is installed adding to an existing non-POE switch or to a POE that doesn't have the POE flavor that is needed by the devices being powered. In this case, power becomes part of the uh, utility, part of the infrastructure, not the network. It's the most flexible POE solution. You have a wide variety of different mixes. We'll talk about them. And uh, you don't need to have POE on every port. It is more efficient. We'll talk about that as well. It is the optimal solution for high power installations where you don't want to have 60 watts or 95 watts on every port. 
looking into a little bit more details on when to use a PoE switch and when to use a PoE mid-span. So there are really four options. You could use just PoE switches. That's good for installations where you have, for example, outdoors. You have few devices. Maybe a small outdoor switch would be uh, a good idea. Or in indoor installations, when it's greenfield, where most of the switch ports are utilized and you have tight rack space. So that's where, for example, large voice over IP installations where all the devices are low power and you want to cram as many PoE switches uh, in a room, that, that's a good, that's a place where people tend to use PoE switches. The PoE mid-spin, on the other hand, and, and I want to make sure that there is a clear differentiation between a mid-spin that may have various numbers of ports and an injector that is common in the market. So the mid-spin is more compact, has less clutter. You can have, for example, a four-port mid-spin instead of having uh, four one-port injectors. You can use it if you're in the middle of the switch refresh cycle. You separate PoE from the switch. So if you just spot a switch that has either no PoE or the wrong flavor, the wrong uh, power capabilities of PoE, you can add a mid-spin. You can keep that mid-spin there without having to replace the switch. And by doing that, you also skip paying for PoE the next time you refresh that switch. Now, PoE stays. You can change, for example, from 100 base T to 1,000 base T, and you can keep the same mid-spin, or you can add security features to that switch, and you can still keep the same mid-spin there. By doing that, you increase the reliability of the network, because if you have a failure in that switch, and I don't know any switch that has 16 years of warranty, when you do have a failure in that switch, you replace the switch only, and you're not going to have to replace PoE. And last but not least, it's easier to install. When you install a PoE switch, you have to reconfigure the network, reconfigure VLANs, and that's not the case with the mid-spin. The mid-spin, it's just plug and play. Now, in some cases, you may want to combine switches and mid-spans. Uh, for example, in outdoor locations where you don't have a specific outdoor PoE switch that has the exact numbers of ports that you want to power, so you may use an outdoor mid-spin complementing that switch. Or you could use a one-port mid-spin indoor that will isolate a switch from lightning. So for example, if you have IP telephony installation and you do want to have uh, one hotspot outside of the building, you do not want to connect between the PoE power supply of powering the phones and what's powering uh, what's outside of the building. For indoor, uh, there are many people who combine switches and mid-spins, again, where you have a large installation with voice over IP, all devices are 15 watts, you have a few devices, a few access points, a few IP cameras that require 30 watts, you add a mid-spin. If you have any device that requires 60 watts or 95 watts, a PoE mid-spin is either the only game in town or it's going to be the uh, more cost-effective solution compared to replace the whole switch. There is a fourth option that I don't really like to talk about, but I think that it's worthwhile to describe, which is non-standard PoE. PoE is great, but there are devices out there that use what is called dumb PoE, which is just, we'll put the power on the cable and see what happens. There are two types of uh, devices. There are devices that uh, use 24 volts. 24 volts is actually, uh, from the safety point of view, uh, very good voltage because it's under the National Electrical Code 30 volts limit we mentioned before uh, for wet areas. But there is no standard defined, so there is no necessarily uh, interoperability between devices from different manufacturers. And you're going to have a limited power available at long range because with 24 volts you need higher currents on the cable. And therefore, you either have to reduce that cable length or the amount of power that you send over the cable, in many cases, both. There are companies that offer 48 volts dumb PoE, which does not have detection whatsoever. Now, that is not safe at all. And if you are using that for any uh, installation that it's either outdoors or that takes a device into a wet area, according to the National Electrical Code, 
you need a certified electrician. So that uh, cost savings of using dumb PoE go down the drain as soon as you bring that electrician uh, to the picture. Now this is all fine and dandy, but why micro SAMI PoE mid-spans? Well, we are the only people that provide 16 years warranty on managed products. So that's two times more than you could buy from Cisco. You don't get that for free either. So that's two Cisco Street refresh cycles. We have excellent coverage, service, and support by the people who wrote the standard. We have standard compliance, so we lower the cost of installation, and, and we certify that we are interoperable with standard compliant devices. And in fact, we have a certified POE compatible devices list that you can find at the URL here in the presentation. We are a Cisco partner for PoE. In fact, we're the only Cisco partner that is a PoE, PSC, mid-spin or switch supplier. We are the only PoE mid-spin supplier that has 1, 4, 6, 12, and 24 port models. So you really can choose the right amount of ports for your deployment. And we have we have SNMPv3 safe, secure management in many of our products. As mentioned before, we have a complete portfolio. We have PoE switches for in or switches for outdoor installations. We have mid spans for indoor and outdoor. We have single ports, multi ports. We have an outdoor hub. We have lightning protection devices. We have managed and unmanaged, and we have devices that work of AC or DC input. We have really the broadest PoE mid span portfolio in the market. We start with indoor solutions. Our indoor solutions go from 15.4 all the way to 95 watts per port. They are high efficient. Uh, some of them dissipate half of the power per port on the cables compared to anybody else in the market. We support gigabit Ethernet rates on all of our products, EMI Class B, compliant with AF and AT standards. And from the indoor point of view, we include both one ports that have AC or DC power inputs, small footprint, small devices, good when you're really powering a single device. But we also have multi-port solutions from 4 to 24 port, 19-inch uh, rack mount. They have the remote management. You can see uh, on the bottom right both the boxes and the screens if you're doing web, uh, web browsing into remote management. Remote management also has the option of logging in through CLI, Delnet, or being managed uh, via SNMP. We support EEPOE, energy efficient POE, again, in the multi-ports, where we cut by 50% the power dissipated on the wire. To give you an idea how much that means, that means instead of wasting 4.5 watts, we dissipate at most 2.25 watts when powering a 25 watts device. And we also have mutual backup. You can use the power supply of one mid-span to back up the other mid-span. Uh, and similar to some people use for switches, this is the only way of doing it for mid-spans, mutual backup. We have a live demo of our network management. The link is here. Yeah, you can click and test and check uh, how easy to use it is. We have outdoor solutions as well. We have one and two port outdoor mid-spans. Uh, we have also a switch that is uh, two ports, and we have a hub that is two ports, 30 or 60 watts power per port. They're very easy to install. There's no need to open the unit during installation. All you need to do is uh, open the connector to an RJ45. Uh, there's no need to open a cabinet. You can just mount them on a pole. You can mount them on a wall. They are IT66 rated and UV protection rated. Very wide temperature range from minus 40 to plus 55 degrees C. Lightning protection. Again, all our products gigabit compliant. They have the proper UL certification for indoor and outdoor. Um, and they have, in the case of the switch, remote management capabilities. You can remotely turn on and off devices that are not behaving properly and that are outdoors, which is extremely convenient. The switch. Uh, has two ports that send PoE, one port that goes to the backhaul. We'll show you later a slide on uh, deployment scenario. 
uh, it has data connectivity between all the ports, and it does have integrated lightning protection. And we'll talk about later why lightning protection is important in outdoor deployments. It is, again, a one port, one box solution, powers two devices, remotely managed. You can see here the management interface. You can see the status of the data port. You can remotely monitor how much power is being consumed by every device. You can shut down. You can reset devices. And a nicer, nice thing about this is that you can place this 100 meters from something that is actually indoor. That's our uplink port. And then from the switch, you have 100 meters in every direction to place, for example, two separate hotspots. We have a new product being launched. Uh, this week, which is the PD Out SP11, which is our first standalone PoE surge protector. It is 5 kilo amps uh, surge, and it's gigabit compliant, PoE in and out. It's outdoor rated. It's a metal enclosure, and it's UL uh, 497B. Now, this surge protector uh, protects different things. It can protect a PoE mid-span or a PoE switch uh, at the, that is placed indoors. So you can see uh, on the, the bottom green bar, that's a surge protector that is protecting a network switch. It could be protecting an outdoor mid-span, uh, but our outdoor mid-span doesn't require one. So why is there one close to the device? Well, it's actually protecting the device. So the bar, the box, in uh, the left green, that's protecting the device. This is useful where you have a long cable. If you have 100 meters between the outdoor mids fan or the outdoor switch and the device being powered, then you want to have a surge protector close to that device. Now, I have other products. We have products, especially if you have a device today that uses either non-standard PoE and you want to take advantage of the safety of PoE. Or if it is a device that just doesn't support PoE at all, and it just supports DC input, we have 10 watts, 25 watts, and 51 watt splitters that output 5 volts, 12 volts, 18 volts, or 24 volts. These are connected from one hand to a PoE source, our mid spend or, or one of our switches, and then it splits between power and data data flows through the device being powered, and power at one of these voltages comes out of the DC barrel connector. Another device we have is the PoE extender. PoE extender is used to extend the range of PoE. I mentioned a few times PoE's range is 100 meters. If you want to power a device that is 200 meters, you would use an extender. The extender is PoE powered and forwards PoE powered. It's a very easy to use box. It has two connectors in PoE, out PoE. So you can get to 200 meters and deliver around 20 watts. If you get to 300 meters, you can uh, deliver around uh, 15. And with 400 meters, you can get data connectivity by daisy chaining these boxes. Now, where could you use PoE? Where are you going to sell PoE? Well, PoE would go into OEMs, into distributors, into VARs, to enterprises, service provider markets. The main applications are IP telephony, wireless LAN, and IP cameras. There are new growth applications, small cells, fiber to the home, wireless broadband, point-to-point -point radios, thin clients, access control, digital signage. And there are other applications that will be coming soon, like LED-based lighting, information kiosks, and occasionally, eventually, we may see TVs. There are some medical TVs that already use PoE med, uh, medical monitors. So we'll work first with PoE at the enterprise market, and then we'll see examples uh, outdoors. So enterprise. Main benefits of PoE would be powering phones, access points, IP cameras. These are the types of devices you find inside buildings at enterprises. You have the major cost benefit of not having to have an electrician uh, to, to install the AC output, but you can also do monitoring and control. You reset hard to reach devices, and you have uh, also the capability of shutting down devices when you don't want them to be on. 
you can pre-schedule with our managed mid spans to shut down completely devices, for example, when there's nobody in the office. The major uh, verticals, industries we go after are education, finance, retail, hospitality, and security and surveillance. A few success stories. So here, a success story from Wendy's, world's third largest fast food burger chain, 69, 6,500 6, locations. They use Cisco Ethernet switches. They decided to deploy IP telephony, wireless, and access points. Competition was POE switch. They decided to use our four-port unmanaged midspan and move to our 24-port, uh, 30 watts, and 15.4 uh, watts gigabit midspans. Uh, over 1,800 units sold and installed, chosen for simplicity and reliability. And remember, we're powering Cisco IP phones and access points. They are a partner. So you did, they did not lose their Cisco warranty over their network. Another success story, Progressive. Fourth, uh, fourth largest auto insurer in the US. It has a heterogeneous network, uh, products from different suppliers. Competition was APOE switch. Uh, they deployed uh, 455 24-port gigabit switches, all managed. The success stories were cost compared to a POE switch, ease of use, and the managing capability. Education success story, University of Alabama, second largest university in Alabama. Over 29,000 undergraduate students. Again, heterogeneous network. Competition, BOE switch to do a voice over IP and Wi-Fi rollout, 765-24G uh, mid spans managed with AC and DC power inputs. Cost project registration through our Empower program, you can see here the integration logistica and a 10% GovAd discount made us win this deal. Now you could use in service provider applications, uh, mid-spins, hubs, and switches from MicroSemi. So let's look at what what do they deploy with these. So WISPs would deploy wireless and access points, but also surveillance, uh, in some cases call centers. Uh, fixed wireless broadband is another service provider type of application. And broadband at the last mile, it could be either wireless broadband at the last mile, or uh, it could be fiber to the home with outdoor fiber to the home ONTs. So here are a few examples because these are less obvious than the indoor. The indoor is pretty straightforward. At the outdoor, different products for different devices being powered. So for example, if you have a Wi-Fi hotspot connected to an indoor backhaul, 1000 base T, we can power this hotspot from indoors. Depending on the length of the cable, you use a surge protector outdoor close to the outdoor device. And on top of that, you use an indoor midspan with a built-in lightning protector. We have that. It's an indoor to outdoor midspan. We have 40 watts and 60 watts capable devices. The Wi-Fi hotspot can consume up to 51 watts. Why use PoE? Single cable. You need to backhaul that, that hotspot anyway. You send power. You can use an indoor UPS. We have lightning protection inside the midspan. And we're isolating the PoE infrastructure from the outdoor device. Now, you could have a power forwarding Wi-Fi access point. There are some access points like this in the market. They have two Ethernet ports. One port receives power. The other uh, port sends power. And for example, you could have wireless backhaul connected to this access point. Or you could have an IP camera connected to this access point. We would suggest, in this case, a 60 watt outdoor midspan that powers the access point, which in turn powers the backhaul. Uh, the midspan, in this case, would not even be sending data through it. It would just send power. It would be used to connect the access point that is normally at a high location, which does not have access to AC power. Uh, we are, in this case, having an access point that consumes up to 25 watts, and it's probably forwarding another 25 watts to the backhaul. Uh, PoE, again, 
for because AC is not common at the pole top. No switch is required here. No enclosure is required here. It's a high reliable solution. Uh, it has lighting protection is IP66. Now there is another way of doing this which we believe is even better. In this case, you have again a 60 watts power source, PoE source, but it is an outdoor hub. What it does, it sends 30 watts on every port. So if you look at the amount of power that is consumed by each one of the devices, the backhaul and the access point, each one consumes 25.5 watts. But it is a lot easier to find an access point that just consumes 25.5 watts versus one that forwards power. So this is a very flexible solution. The reason for using it is any access point, outdoors, 25 watts, any backhaul or any camera, and you connect between the two. Again, no switch required, no enclosure required. Third option is when you have, uh, and this is an option for the outdoor switch, when you have a hot spot that is close, fairly close to a building, uh, and then you have both a hot spot and a camera. It could be also two hot spots. And in this case, you have a thousand base T backhaul. Uh, you could then bring the uplink into the building and then power the two devices, connect between the devices. And nice, you can also manage. It's a managed switch. So you're doing a couple of things. You are managing, controlling the power consumption, potentially resetting the boxes. Uh, you're also isolating the indoor PoE infrastructure from the outdoor device. And uh, we can also connect to uh, mid through the uplink. So that's, that's a possibility for people who want to measure that network. Again, no need to open a box, no need to use an enclosure because this comes ready, IP66. Other applications, and these are more home applications. These are applications where you would have uh, an ONT, optical network terminator, for a fiber to the home, a picture in the bottom, or you would have uh, an LTE modem or a fixed wireless modem, uh, some type of wireless broadband device, again, put outside the home or in the attic of the home, places where you don't have AC power, uh, and in these cases, you would use PoE to power these devices. Uh, PoE is not common in home gateways at all. Uh, you can use a commoditized modem, any modem, and just bring PoE to this ONT or this wireless uh, wireless modem. A few success stories with service providers. The cloud is the second largest WISP in the U.S. after British Telecom. The sound it tells and treats owned by B-SkyB, a very big, very large company. Uh, they have a network which has XDSL gateways, no switch and no PoE. They use the XDSL gateways to provide hotspots. Gateways don't have PoE. So uh, they decided to use our PoE on Port Mitzman to power the hotspot. Uh, over 6,000 uh, wireless LAN access points per year being deployed, powering Rooka's wireless hotspots. Another example, uh, Vodafone. They are well known for uh, cellular telephony, but they also deploy hotspots. Uh, we are powering Cisco 802.11 and 30 watt hotspots, 30k per year. Uh, again, competition with Cisco. But guess what? We're a Cisco certified partner. So when powering the Cisco uh, wireless and access point, it was fine to use our mid spans, both, and pay attention here, these are indoor hotspots. They also have outdoor hotspots. These indoor hotspots uh, using our 12 port and 24 port mid spans. Uh, we won because we had full power mid span at a lower cost than a Cisco PoE switch, and they already had switches in the building. A third success story for a service provider this is for a call center with GVT, where they needed to power uh, 2,000 Avaya phones, and uh, they used our 3501 one-port mid-spins. Uh, the call centers were, were smaller. It was not a single call center. Therefore, the one-port mid -spin made sense. Now, one thing you will notice is that there are several companies that have, especially in the one-port arena, you will see one-port mid that are similar to ours. 
They OEM ours. That's our midsman. So all the companies in this in this picture here, you will find uh, boxes that are very similar. They typically OEM only the one port, but that's a guarantee that whether you buy our one port, a four port, six port, a twelve port, or the twenty-four port, they're all going to be interoperable uh, with the devices by these companies. Now, uh, among the types of devices that are being uh, powered by our midspans, that's why these guys are, are OEMing our midspans, you will see access points for Wi-Fi, wireless backhaul, IP cameras, IP phones, small cells, and even a touch screen. To sum it up, we are the leader in the POE market. We have really a complete full POE midspan portfolio. We have a few nice uh, switch and hub. We include in our portfolio now indoor and outdoor devices. We can power pretty much any device consumes up to 95 watts. Access points, cameras, backhaul, IP phones, fiber to the home, LP modems. That's it for my part. I'm ready for questions. Well, wonderful, Daniel. We appreciate the presentation. A lot of information there. A um, bunch of questions. Let's uh, begin by, um, actually, before we begin the questions, let me give a little background because the most commonly asked question that I get on, on webinars is, wow, there was a lot of information there. How do I uh, watch this again or see the slides or, or do something so that I can understand some of the things that were presented at my pace? Um, Streakwave um, makes webinars uh, from Streakwave webinars available online. Uh, within around 24 hours of the webinar. So by tomorrow, you should see um, on streakwave.com, if you go to the MicroSemi landing page or microsite, the place where MicroSemi resides on Streakwave's page, uh, you can um, access on demand this webinar. It's also on our YouTube channel um, where there's all sorts of uh, videos, uh, learning material, and other webinars. So those two places are the main places that you can find this to watch it again. Um, we'll run through your questions. If your question isn't answered today, please uh, feel free to, to uh, contact one of our sales representatives or send us a question. We're happy to answer that. If we can't answer it, we'll be glad to pass it along to MicroSemi and have them answer it. Um, so let's move on with the questions. So obviously these devices play a, a key role in a growing network. Um, talk to us a little bit about what happens as my network grows. If I am using a switch right now and I'm contemplating consolidating some of my PoE through a mid-span, what if I hit uh, the number of ports that I have uh, available through that mid-span? Can I add another mid-span? Or now I want to do something outdoors and I've got the mid-span in my rack, can I extend out to the outdoors and add another mid-span? Talk about expansion and growth of the network with respect to PoE mid-spans. So if the, there, are, there are different ways of looking at this. If you have, uh, if you have, for example, a 12 port midspan, and you now need 24, you can put in the same rack space, remove the 12 port, put a 24 port, and you did not occupy more space, and now you don't need to reconfigure anything. You're a network, and now you have 24 port. Uh, 24 ports with PoE. If you have a 24 port mid and you need more ports, you have the option of adding again in a 19 inch rack 6, 12, or 24 ports. You only need to pay for the ports that you actually use because of the granularity in the port count. Now, if you're thinking of powering an outdoor device from indoors, that is the case where you actually want to buy a one port. It's actually in the IEEE standard. The IEEE standard precludes uh, when you have different buildings using multi-port PoE switches or mismans. It's a preclusion in the IEEE standard, and it is there to separate, isolate, and protect between devices that damage. If you have lightning protection, even if you have lightning protection, it can still fail uh, depending on where the lightning hits the building. And the last thing that you want is have a 24-port mid-spin or switch that is has one port going out, and now you fry 24 devices. You don't want that. So that's where you would use a one-port mid-spin indoor to outdoor, or put a surge outside of the building, uh, and then have an outdoor, fully outdoor 
uh, mid spin or switch. So the idea there is to isolate the two so that you don't do damage downstream in the network from your outdoor. Uh, Correct. System. Correct. So now if I'm using a system like that and I connect to the outdoor mid span, you had said the outdoor mid span could be up to 100 meters away from the switch. And then the uh, ported device or the power device could be up to 100 meters from there. Is it acting as an extender in that respect? No. That, so, that so let me let me clarify. The outdoor switch will do that, and the outdoor switch will be acting as an extender. So yes, the outdoor you have exactly 100 meters between the outdoor switch, any of the outdoor switch ports, and the the other two. So you can have a triangle if you if you want with the uh, with with the switch in the center and and the three axes on each one 100 meters from the center. When you use the mid spin, the overall range is 100 meters, and then you're free to place the mid spin anywhere you want within that range. The optimal location for place it for placement, if you're looking at uh, energy efficiency, is as close to the device that is being powered as possible. Uh, again, it it's it really depends on what you're doing and how you're trying to do it. If the if the distance if the device is close to the building, up to 100 meters, it doesn't make a lot of economic sense to put the mid spin outdoor. If you if the device is close to a building, it makes sense to put the the, the mid spin indoor. The device outdoor and surge. If the device is not close to building and it's a mesh network, that's where you use the mid span. So you you kind of determine that based upon one where's the most efficient place to put it and the e easiest place to put it, and also so that you're within that hundred meters so you don't lose power. Correct. Correct. And you did say you have extenders, so if you didn't need to go beyond 100 meters, there's a way to do that. Yes, you can do that. Our, our extenders are good for a warehouse type of installations. Uh, and there you can get 100, 200, 300 meters. One nice thing about our extenders is they can, uh, they can provide extension also for places where you don't need necessarily POE. You just have a very, 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 very long cable. and what can you do? I mean, you have to extend it. So uh, if you just have two devices that are 200 meters apart from each other and you do want to connect via Ethernet, you can just put our extender between them. The, of course, the source has to be a PoE switch or a PoE mid-spin. Then you put the extender in the middle. But then the device at the end not necessarily needs to be PoE powered. So let's let's turn now back to the question of a, when I choose a switch or versus a mid span or perhaps both. So I've already bought a switch. I have a switch in place, and I'm only using a few of the ports. Um, but I I want to set up a camera system or a VoIP system or something. And should I use that switch that I already have in its ports, or should I add the the mid span into the system? So it depends on a few questions. So it depends. Well, first of all, if the switch has, does the switch have the power capability? So if the switch is a PoE switch and it supports 15 watts per port, and you want to deploy a device that consumes 30 watts, then the answer is you can't use the switch. You have to add the mid span. The second question is, let's say that that switch can support 30 watts per port. Can it support 30 watts per port on every port, or does it have a limited power supply? And when it has a limited power supply, that's even a trickier question. Because in, and the nature of these devices is that in many cases, they have power allocation that will do the following. You power, you connect the phones, you connect the access point, everything works. Suddenly someone decides to do this uh, all-hands meeting in the company, and all the phones are in speakerphone mode, and all of them turn on at the same time. Now the system crashes, or part of the system crashes, or part of the system is no longer working. The access point now is shut down. So, so these questions are questions that, that do come up 
when you're looking at dimensioning the network, uh, provisioning for the network, it's not enough just to say, hey, I plugged it work. Well, you plugged it work. You plugged it work right now with the current power consumption. You have to look at the worst case power consumption of each one of the devices that is being con uh, connected to that switch, add up the total power, compare that to the maximum power that the switch can provide, and then say, oh no, I may have paid for a switch that said 24 ports, but actually can only do 16 ports full power. Now I have to add a mid-span that has uh, uh, the capability of doing full power delivery. So this is going to um, allow you to, one, add more power if you need to, and two, um, understand the power per port is being accounted for. So in the case that the example that you gave where everybody turns on their speakerphone at once, everything doesn't crash. Yep. Yeah. Now if I do that, let's, let's say we add in um, a mid-span. How smart is the mid-span about the use and allocation of the power? If, if it looks like um, there's going to be a heavy draw, does this mid-span know to shut off something or does it just overpower? What, hap what happens? So we have two two models of mid-spans. We have mid that are full power capable, which will be able to deliver full power on every port, uh, regardless of what devices do, uh, because of the nature nature of the business. If you can do 30 watts and the device cannot consume more than 30 watts, then that's what it is in normal device operation. We have mid that are not full power. These are lower cost mid but that they have the capability of an add-on power supply, redundant power supply, or to be connected to yet another mid -spin. So you can connect back to back to mid -spins. When you have a mid -spin that works like that, if the mid -spin sees that it doesn't have enough power to power all the devices at the same time, it will disconnect, but it won't disconnect all the devices. It will only disconnect the devices that it can no longer power based on priority. So you can either use the ports as a priority. You can say port one is the highest priority, then two, three, four, five, so on, so forth. So you put lowest priority in port 24. Or you can, and that's, and by the way, that's the default. Or you will go and configure in our management spins what is the port priority that you would like to have, what is a high priority, medium priority, and the low priority port. Now the interesting thing about our uh, mutual mid spin backup is that Let's say that you buy two mid spins. They're each 24 ports, and they each come with a 450 watts power supply. So they're half power. So you gain an average supply of 15 watts, but up to 30 watts per port. You can put them back to back, and the power will flow to the mid spin that is actually consuming the power that it needs to consume. So you could have, for example, 20 devices or 25 devices on the mid spin at the top consuming 30 watts each and then you could have devices at the mid spin on the bottom consuming a lot less power let's say 10 watts or, or, or 5 watts each and the system would work so the mid spin that needs more power takes the power from the mid spin that doesn't need it and all of that allocation is done seamlessly there is no need for intervention from the user so all of this, this is a very good um, area to be highlighting because it's really, this is different from a switch. A switch doesn't give you that flexibility and uh, this allows you to have um, you know, greater control over the powering of your, of your network. And, and it looks to me like um, you can do that port by port. Is that correct? You, you can design correct. it so that each port does what you need it to do. Is there a way to monitor the ports? Yes, yes. With our management, uh, management software, you can monitor uh, how much power each port is consuming, whether a port is disabled. Uh, you can reset the ports, and you can configure the time of the day and day of the week when that port will be off, either for security purposes, for example, and, and that's a funny thing. People have all these 802 uh, dot three dot x and eight oh two dot eleven I don't know what all these security schemes for people not answering the network the Wi-Fi network well, the Wi-Fi if the wireless and access point is off you can't connect to it it doesn't matter anything it doesn't matter what level of security uh, you can't hack into network that is off 
And, and that is, in many cases, something that you want to do, not just for power savings, but just for security purposes. So it, it works a little like Watchdog in that respect, because you can go in and um, go to the mid-span and tell it, uh, or see from the monitoring uh, aspect of it, that this board has got an issue, and I can cycle it, or tell it to turn on and off, or turn it off completely if I want. Correct. Correct. So what happens in the case of devices that don't draw consistent power all the time? So I have a PTZ camera, for example, or a, a zoom type camera, adjustable camera, that sometimes draws a higher wattage when it's moving the little motor to move or reposition or focus the camera. And then most of the time it just sits there at a standard rate. But when I want to move that camera, it requires extra wattage. Can, can this system handle that if it's within the standard? Yeah, yeah, as long as it's within the standard, uh, it, it will handle it. It will, it will handle it. And by the way, if it's not within the standard, it will shut it down. It will wait, and we'll turn it on again. So, in in a safe manner, and it will wait a bit before doing that. But there's no, there's no, uh, there's no limitation. You can consume uh, zero watts, and you can consume. Uh, 30 watts, and and you will be as long as you are within the standard requirements, uh, you will be powered, and you're not going to be shut down. And and it's safe that way, right? Because in in some, I've bought a lot of PoE powered devices, and if if you happen to plug the cable into the wrong powering supply, which is too high a wattage, it's bye bye radio or bye bye camera. Does yes, this regulates the the power to the need of the device, correct? Yes, only the amount of power that is required is sent, and it's sent at the right voltage, and that's part of the detection mechanism. So, uh, part part of the safety in PoE is being able to detect that you actually can apply power to that device, uh, and and you know, one of the tests that I do. Uh, when I demo this, I take a Mitsen, I connect an Ethernet cable to it, I turn on the power, connect it to a phone, the person says, oh, look, it's powering the phone. Great. Then I disconnect the phone, and I connect my tongue. You know what happens? Nothing. Because it's safe power. It's doing detection at 5 volts. So it's not only the protection of things like lightning, it's also the protection of putting the wrong power plug into the wrong power place. It, it, it knows not to uh, overpower the device. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really important. Uh, the feature of PoE to not just apply power, you detect you apply power, then you remove power. The power removal is more important even than the power application because if you just said, yeah, I configure it. I know that this device is OK. I control it here. It's on, and it will stay on forever. No, it doesn't stay on forever. It stays on as, as long as there is a valid device with a valid signature connected to it. As long as that device is disconnected, power immediately shuts down within 100 milliseconds. So let's, let's turn um, direction a little bit and talk about those people who are in the audience who are integrators or installers. Uh, we're trying to figure out what's the right device to choose. How do I develop that power budget? How do I determine you know, which of these devices, how many ports, where do I start to understand what's the best solution to meet all these things we've been talking about? Well, you have to start with which device you want to deploy. What, what are you trying to do? And in, in many cases, power is the least concern, but I, I think that power, in some cases, should be an important concern. So let's say that you want to deploy an HD camera outdoor. OK, how much power does it consume? It's not just about how many bits per second it sends, what resolution it sends, but how much power does it consume? And you have to check that to the manufacturer's data sheet. The manufacturer's data sheet will tell you the worst case power consumption. Now, you will take that worst case power consumption for all the devices that you intend to deploy. You put it on a spreadsheet, and you add up. And that's your total worst case power consumption. And now you know the size of the power, what size the power supply needs to be in the PoE switch or the PoE mid-span or the PoE hub that, so, so it can deal with, with these devices. But that's just the power supply. So great, so you will not buy a box that can do less than that amount of power. 
But then you can say, well, should I put all of them in the same box? Then you, you can also look at, OK, how many devices do I have that consume this amount of power, that amount of power, the other amount of power, 15, 30, 60, 95 watts? Then you separate it in groups. Then you can do it, OK, if I'm separating them in groups, then maybe I have a more granular, lower cost system. I'm going to do x times the amount of power that each one consumes. That's one power supply, two power supplies, three power supplies, and then you separate the devices. And this this may be the right the right way of doing it. I think that it will be different when it's indoor or outdoor because you don't want to mix the two together. And it is going to be different when you have a large amount of devices that are 15 watts versus a large amount of devices that are 30 watts. And this will determine whether you'll only look at maximum power per port of the mid-span and then the power supply budget, whether you want to put all the devices that consume a lot of power together, or whether you want to actually mix and match between low power consumption and high power consumption devices. So. It is, uh, it's, it's nice, it's Lego. So it, it does give you that flexibility that you need in order to budget up or budget down and, and give some real sort of scientific approach to how much power and how you're going to power that and where you're going to approach it. I wanted to mention a couple of other things because you mentioned them briefly, but they're really important. <clears throat> if you are an installer and you're doing um, WLAN, indoor APs, um, or you're doing camera installations for security and surveillance, and you're doing it with a number of cameras, or you're doing it with a number of APs, as you draw those back to your network, um, if you're not using a mid-span, very frequently you've got this pile of uh, bricks, PoE bricks. So one thing that the, the mid-span allows you to do is to get rid of the spaghetti in your, in your um, network closet, because you can consolidate them into the mid-span and not have to use all of those powering devices. The other thing is, is that I think it's very important to say that if you are one of those installers, you may not always have the best or closest relationship with the CIO or the CTO or the, the network management team. And so you can plug all these things into the mid-span and then hand off a single wire to the, to the switch or to the network without disrupting that network. Maybe talk a little bit about that. We we're just about towards the end, but last thing I want to talk about is that. So we don't upset the IT department with this. We, we add in components, we power them, but we don't mess up the network. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. You're, uh, from the network point of view, instead of having to reconfigure what happens between everything and everything, because once you change the switch, you have to reconfigure the network, all you're doing, you're adding a managed device, or an unmanaged device if you choose so, but preferably a managed device. And now you can see the devices that are being powered uh, from the point of view of power consumption. That's it. And if you don't want to manage, if you just want to say, well, let's first have the network working. Let's first have the users who need their phones, phones working. You do that. That takes five minutes. Just add the mid-span connect the patch cables properly, boom, the phones are on. Now you can take your sweet time to configure the management of the mid-span because the nice thing about it is that it turns on immediately. You don't need to configure it for it to apply power to compliant devices. Great. Well, lots of information, lots of stuff to learn. I want to thank Daniel Feldman from MicroSemi for this uh, wonderful presentation today. If you have additional questions, I encourage you to give us a call at Streetwave Wireless at 888-604-5234. There's a lot of information about these products on our landing site at streetwave.com. Go to MicroSemi. MicroSemi has a wealth of information on their website as well. Um, we're always happy to talk to you about applications, solutions, the equipment, the things that you need in order to make these things happen. Streetwave Webinars presents topics and information about products of interest to the wireless industry and to the broadband industry and all of the related parts. Uh, we encourage you to watch our webinars on streetwave.com um, or on YouTube slash streetwave. Please join us again next time for another compelling topic. Again, I'd like to thank Daniel Feldman for this wonderful presentation. 
and I invite you to come back again. Have a wonderful day, and thank you very much.